Welcome to lecture number 10. Today we are going to focus on nomenclature as well as some hydrocarbon chemistry. So that's just chemistry of basic CH compounds. Okay. So nomenclature is something that I've touched on. I don't really consider it too much in my courses. Uh, I think it's something that you develop. The more you work with it, the more you practice it, the more that you become comfortable with organic nomenclature because it is almost another language. There are hundreds, perhaps thousands of words specifically for organic chemistry and chemistry in general, and it can get overwhelming. But today we'll simply take a little time to understand the basics of nomenclature. Oftentimes you'll see IUPAC name or systematic name. IUPAC name or systematic name. Okay, this is just your standard uh, chemical name, okay, that's given based on structure. There are, there's also common names. For example, sodium hydroxide, you could see as lye, right? Um, acetic acid, it's vinegar, dilute solution of acetic acid. So there's, there's a lot of common names as well. But today we'll be looking at the IUPAC names or the systematic names, which is sort of the base names of molecules. So here's a little chart over here. You'll see prefixes. Um, these prefixes are based on the number of carbons that we have. So this is for naming hydrocarbons. So if we're looking to name something like this, let me use black. If we're looking to name something like this, a three carbon chain, we would simply use the prefix prop, three carbons, and then the ending would be ane, A-N-E indicating a hydrocarbon. A-N-E is the ending which indicates a hydrocarbon. So that just means carbon and hydrogen. So if we have a six-membered chain, what would that be called? This would be called hex, Ain, hexane. Okay, so we can use this chart here to figure out basic uh, chains: propane, butane, pentane, hexane, etc. And it's very simple to name these. Okay, what if these are not a chain, but what if they are part of a ring? Well, all we do is we add cyclo beforehand. So if we have a three-membered ring, this becomes cyclopropane instead of propane. If we have a six-membered ring, this becomes cyclohexane. Okay, we'll see, we'll talk much more about cyclohexane shortly. Six-membered ring system is very important in organic chemistry, but nonetheless, for naming ring systems, you simply put cyclo before the uh, word, so cyclohexane, cyclopropane, etc. Okay. Now, I'm just going to draw a couple examples here. So we're going to move into naming with functional groups, with substituents, because obviously we're not going just to be working with hydrocarbons, right? We'll have some functional groups attached to those hydrocarbons, or our hydrocarbons will be branched. So for example, if we have something like this, okay, this is not a straight chain right, of just carbons. We have this branch here. We have a branching system. So this molecule, we'll talk about rules in a second. This molecule would be called 3-methylhexane. Okay, we'll talk about the rules for naming in a minute. But if you can see why this would be called 3-methylhexane, you're off to a good start. Because on the third carbon, we have a methyl group. On the third carbon, we have a methyl group. And our longest possible chain, or our parent chain, is called hexane. It's a six-membered parent chain. So this would be 3-methylhexane. Again, we'll talk about the rules for naming in a second here just to give you some examples of the things that we'll see. We could also see a ring system like this. Obviously, we're going to look at ring systems quite a lot. And if we have a little 
functional group coming off that ring system, what would we call this? Well, this would be called ethyl cyclohexane. Ethyl cyclohexane, because what do we have here? We have cyclohexane with an ethyl group or ethane coming off of it. So this would simply be called ethyl cyclohexane, okay? So how am I deriving these names? Let's look at an example here using some rules. Let's write down some rules for naming. Okay, the first rules you're going to identify, the parent chain. Okay, identify the parent chain. That's the longest possible chain of carbons. Uh, number two, you're going to identify your substituents. Number three, you'll number the parent chain. giving the lowest possible numbers to the substituents. And then number four, we're going to arrange the substituents alphabetically, ignoring prefixes, if we do happen to have multiple substituents. Okay, so these are the rules that we're going to follow as we work through some examples here. Okay, so let's take an example here. Let's go like this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Sure, let's put eight. Let's put that there. And we'll put a methyl group there also. Okay, so let's take this hydrocarbon and let's name it. So the first thing we have to do is identify the parent chain and that parent chain is just simply the longest possible chain of carbons that you can make. So it's sort of trial and error here, okay? You can go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There's a chain of seven. We can go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There's a chain of eight. That looks like the, the longest possible chain we can make. So that chain in red is going to be our parent chain the longest possible chain of carbons we could make. Okay, so we've identified our parent chain, the longest chain we have. Then we identify the substituents, which is everything that's not our parent chain. So here we have two substituents. We have these two substituents, which are both methyl groups, okay? Both methyl groups. Let me write right over here, parent chain, is eight carbons, which is going to be octane, right? Octane. Substituents. We have a methyl group and we have a methyl group. So we have two methyl groups, methyl and methyl. Now what we have to do is number the parent chain to give a location to these functional groups, these substituents. So let's number the parent chain. And when we do so, we want to give lower numbers to the substituents. What does that mean? It means that we shouldn't number from over here like this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight because then our substituents are on carbons five and six. We should start on the right and number like this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now our substituents are on which carbons? Three and four. Okay, so on our parent chain, we have three methyl and four methyl. Okay, we use this little hyphen in between. Okay, so these are the two substituents we have. We have a, a methyl group. I'll underline it here. We have a methyl group on the third carbon 
and we have a methyl group on the fourth carbon. Okay, see, that's simply telling us where those substituents are. Now we have to arrange the substituents alphabetically, ignoring prefixes, okay? So we have two substituents. We have a methyl group and we have a methyl group, okay? So we could write this out as 3-methyl, 4-methyl octane, but when we have two substituents that are exactly the same, then we can combine them, okay? So here, we're going to do it like this instead. We'll say three, four, dimethyl octane. Three, four, dimethyl octane, okay? If we only had a methyl group on three, it would simply be three methyl octane. If we only had a methyl group on four, it would be four methyl octane. Since we have a methyl group on both three and four, this would be three, four dimethyl octane, okay? So here we didn't really have to use rule number four. We don't have to arrange the substituents alphabetically, but in some cases, like the next one we'll see, uh, there will be more substituents and we'll have to arrange them. Okay. Okay, so looking at this example now, going to be a little more complicated. Okay, so we have obviously quite a bit of branching through here. Still just hydrocarbon, carbons and hydrogens. Let's start by identifying our parent chain, our longest possible chain. If you wanna take a second and pause the video, try to find the parent chain or find the name, feel free. The parent chain is going to be going all the way through the molecule like this, obviously including this section down here. That's going to give us an eight carbon chain. So the parent chain, is going to be octane, eight carbons. Let's identify the substituents, what's left. Well, we have a methyl group, we have a methyl group, and we have an ethyl group, two carbons, ethyl, ethyl group. So we have a methyl group, a methyl group, and an ethyl group. Write that down here, substituents, a methyl, a methyl, and an ethyl. Okay, number of the parent chain, so we have the lowest possible numbers on the substituents. So we're going to want to start over here rather than on the other side to give these guys low numbers, two, three, and four. Seven, Eight, so those are the numbers we would use on the parent chain. Okay, so let's update our substituents. This would mean we have two methyl, three methyl, and four ethyl, four ethyl. Okay, two methyl. Again, we have a methyl. This is always what I like to do, underline here. On our updated substituents, we have a methyl group on the second carbon. We have a methyl group on the third carbon. And we have an ethyl group on the fourth carbon. Okay, so there's our updated substituents. Okay, so let's put it all together into a name. So what we could do is we could put, starting with ethyl, because ethyl comes before methyl, right? E comes before M. So going alphabetically, we'll start with the ethyl, 4-ethyl. And when you separate your substituents, you also use a hyphen. So there ends up being a lot of hyphens. Um, there's a lot going on grammatically as we in increase the complexity of these names, but try to stick with me for now. So we have 4-ethyl 
and we also have 2-methyl, and we also have 3-methyl. Okay, and then we have octane as our parent chain. Now again, just like the case we saw before, when we have similar functional groups, we can combine them. So instead of saying 2-methyl, 3-methyl, let's say 2 comma 3 dimethyl octane. Now we don't move the dimethyl in front of the ethyl because we ignore that di prefix, okay? I like to arrange the substituents alphabetically first, individually. So we have methyl, methyl, and ethyl. Arrange them alphabetically, and then you can combine your like ones. Don't change the order, though, okay, if you followed me. So ethyl will still come before dimethyl alphabetically because we're ignoring di. We ignore that di prefix. Either way, let's work through that name. We have an octane chain. That's our parent chain, octane. On the fourth carbon, we have an ethyl group. On the second and third carbons, we have methyl groups. Two, three, dimethyl. Okay. Four ethyl, two, three, dimethyl, octane. Okay. So this is the IUPAC naming system. It's very straightforward, but it does take a little time to understand. Now I'm not, I never give tests or quizzes specifically asking for IUPAC names, but you should be able to understand as I'm talking through problems, you should be able to follow along with the basic nomenclature that I'm using, okay? Now here's another table and this table is showing all of your functional groups. Well, perhaps not all of them, but many functional groups that we'll see Okay, uh, we see it's first we have alkanes, we have alkenes. So when we talk about double bonds, um, we're going to use the, pref the suffix ene -E as opposed to ane, -E, indicating that we have a double bond. If we have a triple bond, that's an alkyne, y-n-e. Alcohols, we've worked with a few times, so we end that with o-l. We have ethers, which have carbons on either sides. Epoxides are a little less common, but it's a three-membered ring with oxygen in there. We're going to be working a lot with haloalkanes. Okay, remember if we have a halogen like chlorine, bromine, iodine, or fluorine attached to carbons, that's called a haloalkane. And then all these circles in green, we have functional groups, which we will see quite often in the next few chapters. Um, these are going to be carbonyl-based functional groups, so aldehydes, ketones, carboxylic acids. We talked about a lot of those in the acid chapter. Um, so, so all of these are going to be things that you should be aware of, particularly the ones in red and green and blue, okay, the upper two rows. Um, we will see um, maybe some basic amines, a nitrile, perhaps an isocyanate or an imine, although the, the first two rows are definitely the most important, okay? So as I'm talking through problems in the future, I'll be using these words, this terminology, and you should be able to sort of follow along and understand which part of the molecule I'm talking about, okay? So definitely something to look at. Let's just quickly look at a few examples. If we were to have a four carbon chain with a chlorine here, what would we call this? Two chlorobutane, two chlorobutane. We have a butane chain, four carbon chain, and we have a chlorine on the second carbon, two chlorobutane. What if we had an alcohol at that position? What would that be called? Well, we could call this 2-butanol or butane 2 all Okay, you can see it written either way. Either way, we have a butane, and then we have a alcohol, OL, 
on the second carbon. Butane with an alcohol on the second carbon. So you might see this as 2-butanol or butane 2 all. Okay. What if we had a double bond at that position? Double bond here. This would be 2 but not an, but in. Remember, if we have a double bond, ene. -E. So this would be 2 butene because we have a four carbon chain butane with a double bond, in at the second carbon. We have an ene at the second carbon, so this is 2-butene. If we had a triple bond at that position, this would be 2-butyne. We have an ine at the second carbon, 2-butyne. If we had a carbonyl at that position, this would be Two butanone, two butanone. We have an own carbonyl at the second carbon, two butanone. Okay. What if we had what if it was a carboxylic acid? We had a four carbon chain. One, two, three, four. What would this be called? Butanoic acid. We have a four carbon chain with an acid on the end. So but, and then we add oic acid. So butanoic acid. So a four carbon chain, that's an acid. Okay. And you can do this for any of those functional groups, right? I just listed off a few random ones, but those functional groups you're going to have to get a little bit familiar with it's just to sort of keep up with the course, okay? So looking at a slightly more complicated example using different functional groups, let's take this. Okay, let's take this one and let's apply our rules to name this. So let's start with a parent chain. Our parent chain in this case is going to be simply straight across the molecule. So our parent chain is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine carbons. So it is going to be nonane. Okay, that's our parent chain. What about our substituents? Let's look at whatever's left. We have a chlorine, a hydroxy, and an ethyl group. So let's write those out. Chloro, hydroxy, and an ethyl group. Okay. All right, and then we have to number the parent chain. Let's number the parent chain now. Now remember when we number, we want to give the substituents the lowest numbers possible. So let's start from the left here and we will go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. Okay, so let's update our substituents. Let's call them 2-chloro, 4-hydroxy, and 5-ethyl. Okay, so those are our updated substituents. Let's put it all together to make a name, okay? Typically, you will see your hydroxies, your alcohols included in the name itself. Now, you don't have to. It's just an option. 
but I think that's what we'll do. So we'll start there and we will call it four no and null because we start with no name, no name. But if it's an alcohol, all right, if you just ignore the chlorine and the ethyl, what do we have? We have four known and all. Okay, we have a no name chain with an alcohol in the fourth carbon. Then we can go back here and add our substituents. Let's put chloro first alphabetically, right? So we'll put two chloro. And we'll put five ethyl, four known and all. Okay. Now that's all I have for nomenclature. We're going to start looking at some hydrocarbons now. Uh, the nomenclature section I understand was very brief, was very rushed, and that was purposeful because none of this will be on exams that I give. None of this is uh, as important to me as other sections. I think nomenclature is something that you will get as you work with it. Okay. So there's no real need to go out of your way to memorize every, all the different names and words in organic chemistry, because you will simply adapt and learn the language as you use it. If you're just in this class, just to get through it, and you just want to get a good grade and move on, it's not important for you to remember all the different prefixes and suffixes. Okay, What we want to be able to do in this course is learn how to think differently, learn how to understand the relationships between atoms and molecules and uh, how, re how and why reactions occur. I am not interested in you inputting a library of words into your head. Okay, so this may have been a little rushed, um, but there are a lot of good sources online, a lot of good other sources if you want more practice with nomenclature. But again, the more we work with it, the more we'll get it. If you choose a career where you use certain chemistry concepts, you will become more familiar with them. And if you go into a career where you will not use them, you will forget about them. Okay, so there's no points in learning all of the nomenclature. Let's move on to some hydrocarbons. Okay, hydrocarbons. So we're talking about just obviously carbons and hydrogens. Carbon chains are the basics for all organic life, right? That we know of. Potentially there's other life out there where we're not carbon based. However, we are carbon based life forms. So hydrocarbons are incredibly important. Okay. Let's take ethane as an example to start. Ethane. Ethane is as a Lewis structure, two carbon chain. Okay, two carbon chain. We could draw it as a Lewis structure like this. We could also draw it as a bond line structure, just as a line, right? Just a line like that would be ethane, two carbons connected with a line. Okay, we could also draw them sort of as a three dimensional sawhorse projection. So I'm going to write this here. It's going to look like this. We're going to consider these atoms, these molecules, sort of in three dimensions, this unit. Okay, so here's ethane sort of in a sawhorse projection where we're looking at the molecule at an angle. Each of these carbons, I'll highlight in red, are tetrahedral, right? Each of those carbons are tetrahedral, sp3 hybridized, okay? Those hydrogens are in the shape of a pyramid around those carbons. So we're looking at this molecule of ethane sort of up and away from it at an angle. This would be a sawhorse projection. Let's write that here. That's a sawhorse projection. Okay, we could also draw it as wedges and dashes. So we could draw the same molecule like this. 
where we have a chain and then we have some wedges and dashes. Now these are things that we will become much more familiar with as we go. I'll quickly try to explain what I mean by them here once I fill in everything. Call this wedge and dash. <clears throat> okay, so wedge and dash. So we're looking at this molecule horizontally where everything in this line here in red is in the plane of the screen or the plane of the whiteboard here. Everything here is in the same plane. The only things that are out of plane are the wedges and the, and the hashes here, the dashes. So anything with a wedge is coming out towards you, and anything with a dash is going out away from you. Let me highlight in red on the sawhorse projection what we're looking at. So on the sawhorse, all of that stuff in red is the same stuff in red on the wedge and the dash. We are just rotating it and looking at it uh, orthogonally. Okay, so everything in red is in the same plane, but then you see these two hydrogens. Maybe I'll highlight them in blue. I'll highlight this one in blue and this one in blue. They're on the back side, so that's going to be these with the dashes. And then maybe we'll go with green here, indicating that these green hydrogens are coming out towards you right there. Okay, so hopefully you can see that. So you can use wedges and dashes to indicate and get some three-dimensionality to it. And we could also look, we can draw this molecule looking straight down this sawhorse projection or straight down here. So I'm going to put an eye here. This is sometimes something you'll see in organic chemistry. So this is like an eye. So if you're the observer here and you were looking straight down this bond, what would you see? How would you see it? And we call that a Newman projection. I'm going to draw it over here. So we'll be working with some Newman projections today. <laughs> So what we do for a Newman projection is we say, okay, if we're looking straight down this line, what do we see? Well, we see three different bonds, one down to the left, one down to the right, and one straight up. Now, in this case, they're all hydrogens. And I can continue with the color coding. This red one is straight up, right? If this is your perspective, this eye, this red carbon is kind of going straight up and all of them are coming towards you a little bit. But that red one is going up. This blue one is down into your left. See that back there? Then you have this green one coming out to the right, right? Now on the back side, what we do is we put a we put a circle here just to give the molecule, let me draw a better circle, just to give the molecule some three-dimensionality. Okay, so what we do is we draw a circle and then coming out from the other side, we draw the other three bonds, one, two, and three. Now these are also hydrogens in the back since we're just looking at ethane, just a two carbon chain. We can color code these. The red hydrogen you see is going straight down in the back, right? Up and to the right is that green hydrogen. I'm going to cover right here just for more clarity. Okay, and then the blue one going back out to the left right there. 
Okay, so that circle, this black circle I drew here is just to give some three dimensionality to the structure so we can see which ones are in front and which ones are in back. See how I did that? These three are clearly in front of the circle and those three bonds are clearly in the back of the circle. So the circle isn't representing an atom or anything. That circle is just giving us three dimensionality, some perspective, okay? Just clearly showing us that these three uh, bonds are on this carbon, and then these three bonds are on the back carbon. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense, those perspectives. The Newman projection is the one that we're going to sort of focus on a little bit more today. Okay, and we're gonna talk about why I drew it like this, what makes it special, and why we can use Newman projections to understand some stability of hydrocarbons, okay? We'll just touch on Newman projections a little bit, and then the next lecture we will um, continue our discussion on hydrocarbons, uh, stability, Newman projections, etc. So let's just get a little more practice drawing Newman projections and understanding the basics, and then we'll continue our discussion in the next lecture. So let's draw a Newman projection for this compound. Okay, let's draw a Newman projection for a four carbon chain. And we have a wedged bromine here and a wedged bromine here. Remember the wedges are coming out at you, which means in the back we have a hydrogen here. And in the back we have a hydrogen here, okay? So if we draw a Newman projection, you can draw it from either side. I'm going to pick this side here, where this is our perspective. This is our eye looking down this bond. Let's draw that Newman projection. I'm going to start by drawing a circle. And let's draw whatever is attached to this front carbon first. If this is our perspective, where we have this eye, what's straight up above us? This is a CH3, right? CH3, CH3 on either end. So going straight up is a CH3, or you could abbreviate it ME for methyl, either way. Going down into the left is this bromine, okay? Because from this perspective, bromine is coming out at us. Remember, this carbon is in the shape of a tetrahedron. So this bromine is sort of coming out at us and this hydrogen is going away from us into the screen. So this hydrogen is out to the right if our perspective is right here, right? Looking down this bond in the plane of the paper, the hydrogen is down to the right. Now on the back carbon, what's going on in the back carbon? Going straight down from our perspective is that methyl group The bromine coming out at us from our perspective looking at the screen, if we go down here from this perspective, the bromine is going up and to the left. And this hydrogen going into the screen is up to our right, okay? This is why it's so important to understand molecular geometry because that geometry allows you to understand the three-dimensionality of these systems much more easily, okay? So here's our Newman projection. Again, we use this circle here to give us some three-dimensionality and show us which atoms are in front and which atoms are in back. Okay, so let's now just quickly end on a discussion of why we're drawing everything the way that we're drawing it. I'm going to draw a Newman projection here just of ethane. So we have our three hydrogens on the front carbon and we have our three hydrogens on the back carbon. So this would be the Newman projection for ethane. Now this angle here between two things on the front and the back, we call this a dihedral angle, 
a dihedral angle. And when everything is staggered like this, it's 60 degrees, okay? 60 degrees when you have everything staggered and everything is equally spaced, okay? That's the dihedral angle. You could also see this called torsional strain. Okay, torsional strain is another name for this. So you'll see either the dihedral angle, or if you're talking about the strain associated with this, which we'll discuss now, you might see that called torsional strain. Now, generally speaking, we would call this conformation a staggered conformation. This is staggered. Why is this staggered? Well, because everything is equally spaced out. See how our, everything here is kind of spread out nicely? Okay, between the front carbon and the back carbon, everything is spread out or staggered. So we would call this a staggered conformation, and this is favored. Things in organic chemistry, remember, if you look back at Vesper theory, they want to be spread out as much as possible. Atoms and things, they typically don't like to bump into each other. Typically, we want space, okay? Especially for large atoms, they want space. So staggered conformation is better because there's simply more space, okay? Everything's not all crammed together in the same spot. Now, we could also draw ethane like this. Draw this one here and here. Now we could draw a um, ethane, a Newman projection of ethane like this, where everything is sort of clumped together. And we would call this eclipsed. This is an eclipsed conformation because the groups are eclipsing each other, sort of like a lunar eclipse right, or solar eclipse where the sun and the moon are lined up with, with the earth, okay? These are eclipsing groups. Now the groups are sort of right next to each other or right in front of each other, okay? I'll circle the groups here. The groups are sort of right on top of each other instead of the staggered conformation where they're all spread out, right? This is much better when they're spread out. So the eclipsed conformation is going to be higher in energy and less stable. That makes sense, right? If everything's clustered together, it's going to be less stable, going to be a higher energy system, okay? Okay, so I think we'll stop this lecture here, and we will continue our discussion. We're about halfway through with hydrocarbons. We'll finish off in lecture 11. Okay, so just to summarize this last little bit here, uh, we can draw hydrocarbons in a lot of different ways. One way that we can draw them is a Newman projection, which is what we've seen here. This is a Newman projection where we're looking sort of straight down a carbon-carbon bond that I just bolded there in black. We're looking straight down a carbon-carbon bond to get a perspective on how things are spread out around that CC bond. They can be spread out in one of two ways, a staggered conformation on the left or an eclipsed conformation on the right. The staggered conformation is favored because there's more space for those substituents, for those atoms to exist in. An eclipse conformation is higher in energy and less stable because those atoms are going to be sort of bumping into each other. They're going to be simply less happy, more unstable, okay? Now we're gonna take these concepts and develop them a little bit further in the next lecture and then convert this information into some studies on ring systems, okay? But for now, hopefully that makes sense. Um, again, with nomenclature, don't worry too much about it for my course in particular. Perhaps your professor, if you're, if you have a different professor, perhaps uh, 
they take nomenclature more seriously. However, I'm a big fan of not memorizing things. I'm a big fan of learning things instead. Okay, so that's everything for lecture 10. Um, I'll see you in lecture number 11, where we will finish our discussion on hydrocarbons.